So let's get into tonight. And uh, our next point, the next thing in line here is be sure that there is no doubt or unbelief permitted in your life. Be sure that no doubt or unbelief is permitted in your life. Go with me, if you will, to the 11th chapter of the book of Mark. Ah, that's, that's, a, that's a real um, surprise, isn't it? You start talking about faith, it's hard not to get into Mark 11. Amen. Hallelujah. You know the story, how that... Um, In verse 11, it says that when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he went into the temple, and when he looked round about upon all the things, and now he, even time was come, he went out and to Bethany and on, uh, with the twelve. And on the morrow, uh, when he was come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, he came um, happily, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. Now, we understand, if you go back and do a little study, you know, that the fig trees would bloom, leaves would also get their figs at the same time. It's kind of a parallel thing. And so, Jesus saw the leaves, he went to it, and got nothing, there were the figs there. Now, he knew what the time of the figs, but if it, the fig tree had leaves, it's supposed to have the figs, you know? So, it was a false advertisement, all right? So, and he answered it, because it said, I got figs, and it didn't, so he answered it. And said, you lied to me. You lied, lied, lied. You know, you lied. All right. He said, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And, I like this, the, his disciples heard it. Y'all hear? Let me say something. Notice he said it. What, he didn't think it. He didn't have a choir music going, Woo! as the shadow of his hand came to the fig tree or whatever else, it says his disciples heard it, all right? And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus uh, came into the temple, began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and they were through the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he would not allow that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of all nations, the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Now, I'll tell you something, you know, you kind of look at this, you kind of, you think, well, maybe we ought to take a little more look at some stuff. Now, I understand there's nothing wrong with a church bookstore or whatever. You understand, when they were doing this at that time, uh, they, were, they were running a scam on the people. The people would bring their, their sacrifices. The priests would come out and say they weren't, they were spotted or they were unclean. They couldn't be used for a, a temple sacrifice, but would sell them a pure or spotless lamb or whatever, and then they would turn around and um, put that back into the, into the pool and sell it again. They were, they were ripping the people off. But they had to do it because the priest said it wasn't right. They, they couldn't use it. They had them over a barrel, and God don't like that. That's why I call them a den of thieves. See, have they been, see, because you know, actually, if you go back and study the book uh, back in the Old Testament, they were permitted to sell um, animals if their journey was too long for, for cash or for money. And when they got to where the, the sacrifice would be offered, they were permitted to buy them if their journey was too far to try to bring animals all the way to Jerusalem. So, so that, that was nothing wrong with that. But he said they were a den of thieves. They, <coughs> they were doing things in a way that were ripping the people off. They'd come with a sacrifice and say, well, you can't use that. It's useless to us. Here, we'll sell you these. And they'd use them but they had, to, see, they were lost. They lost the animals they brought, and they had lost the money they had to pay, to make that sacrifice. And then they would turn right around and stick those back in the corral, and then sell them to somebody else, den of thieves. That ticked them off, and I don't blame them. Using, using that position of authority to manipulate the people. Amen. And I'm going to say something. Some of the stuff that was taught on prosperity got close to that, or did, it just crossed over into that. Give up. You can't get blessed unless you give up. All that kind of stuff. Amen. Well, see, God doesn't bless dens of thieves. Now, people say, listen, people can make things big. People can make, listen, people say, well, you know, if it wasn't God, if God's not in it, they wouldn't be so big. We go look at the Mormon church. Got some of the biggest buildings around. Hello, got all kinds of money. You can't go by that. Just because it got a big building don't mean it's not, doesn't mean it's God. 
All right? So, anyway, so he, he, he said, you, you know, but he, I noticed he called the building my house. Should be called by all, by all nations the house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and listen to this, and saw how they might destroy him. Wow, they, he's messing up their money gig. I'll tell you what, you start messing with people's money and, and, and shysters' money and, and spiritual carpetbaggers' money, and they'll want to kill you. Hello? Um, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And when evening was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning as he passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, see, this is what the story. See, we got a story in within a story, you know, about him running the money changers out and so forth. But at the beginning of that, he had, he had come out and cursed that fig tree. Amen. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remember, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed, how they know the curse, they heard him, is withered away. And Jesus answered and said, Have faith in God. Or, have the faith of God. Or some people say, say the God kind of faith. So Jesus, now listen to this. He, knows he, didn't, he didn't go, well, Peter, I... And God manifest in the flesh. I've done this to prove to you that I'm divine. That's not what he said. He could have, but he didn't. Why? He took the opportunity for an object lesson. It was the opportunity to put into operation an object lesson whereby <coughs> he could teach him something. Praise the Lord. And we want to thank God that we can have object lessons. Amen. And so he said, he said, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. And then he goes on and begins to teach on how faith operates. Now, notice we said the point here is, be sure no doubt or unbelief is permitted in your life. Listen to this verse. For verily, now verily is a, in King James time, is a strong affirmation. Okay? For verily, I say unto you that whosoever, how many whosoever's we got here? Then we used to sing an old song in the church. I know it was Pentecost church. I don't know if the, you know, the other church, but I know it was in our hymnals. You know, whosoever surely meaneth me. Amen? Whosoever surely meaneth me. How many remember that song, that hymn? Brother Bill. They sang it in the Baptist church too. All right. <laughs> whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me. Surely mean it. They probably didn't sing it in the Catholic Church, but we sang it in the Baptist and we sang it in the Pentecostal Church, all right? Amen. So, whosoever, who, how many whosoever's do we have? All right, okay, we've got 100%. 100% of y'all know you're a whosoever. I'm glad to know that. Because if you didn't, we're in real trouble. All right, that whosoever shall do it shall say unto this mountain. Again, that's that verbal thing. You got to speak to your mountains. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. That's a big one. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. So here he says here, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, amen, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Um, <coughs> there is an imperativeness about not doubting. And we've got to recognize, we've got to learn to recognize doubt, deal with doubt, strike doubt down, and overcome and win. Yeah. Amen. If you want answers to your prayer, if you want answers to your faith, you're going to have to rid yourself of doubt. Well, how do I rid myself of doubt? Spend more time in the Word. Amen. 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 Hebrews 3.14 says, We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And sometimes it's easy to not hold your confidence or your, your, the, the, um, the beginning of your confidence steadfast unto the end. You can start out with a, with a charge and then, does I mean fade? Y'all hear you going home. 
God doesn't want you fade. The God doesn't want you getting started and then and then choke it on the end. He wants you to see it through to the end. Hallelujah. Amen. Wants to hold fast your faith. Now, the Bible says, uh, uh, "Prove all things, hold fast that which is good." We got to hold fast to our faith. We got to be uh, fighters who fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Amen. And you can't let doubt enter in. <clears throat> Satan will try to bring doubt. I mean, as a matter of fact, when you're trying, when you're when you try, start trying to exercise your faith, he'll show up with a truckload of doubt, dump it in your front yard, and start shoving it up on your front porch. And if you open the door, he'll just throw it right on into your foyer. Amen. And if you start, if you don't really do anything about it, he'll call in a, uh, I forgot what those Navy, big old, uh, big Navy uh, helicopters with the dual blades on top of them. They, they, they could carry, they could carry tanks. I forgot, this. they're not, well, they, they're not Chinook helicopters, are they? Anybody remember? Yeah. Uh, Chinook, Chinook helicopters. Great, big old things. I mean, the rotor blades, you know, boom, 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 boom. They carry a tank. Satan will show up with a Chinook and drop doubt all over your house. Are you here? He'll just dump it all over you. If you, let, if you start letting the door. Now, we've got to maintain the position of faith. We cannot allow doubt or unbelief to enter in in any arena. You got to fight it like the plague, because it is a plague. It's a plague to your faith. It's a plague to your receiving. Are you here? Now, you know, um, Nathan got struck with something right before Christmas, and we, we took him over to the doctor just to get, get checked out and to get him something to get some relief from that pain, because he was in, that, that, that thing hit his throat like in one night. And, uh, I mean, just you need to get something. Walked in, and they had everybody sitting there with masks on. If you got these symptoms, put these masks on. Like, Lord, you know? And people sitting around, you know, and, and I know they felt kind of dumb. They're all sitting in the waiting room with masks on. You know, I didn't have to put one on, but they were all, everybody else had them on sitting in there. People, and as soon as they got outside, they took them off, you know. But they did what they told them to do because they, you know, they, 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 they were having to obey. It's amazing. And, and then so same people will get, go in there and see the doctor. They'll write out a prescription. They'll say, go take this and go take that, you know, and da 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 da, -da and they'll go do it. We'll come to the Bible and we'll say, oh, that was a good idea. We've got to, we've got to stay with the Word. And if you're going, if you're going to, if, if your faith seems weak and your victory lost, you've got to make sure there's no doubt or unbelief in you. You know, the Bible even tells us we can let the things we once learned slip. And we can't afford to let them slip. We've got to stay with them. Amen? Truth is truth. The Word of God's true. And so we want to stay with it. So um, it, we, we are made partakers in, of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Uh, look over here into the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. There are some more things along these lines here. So verse 22 of Hebrews 10 says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Draw near with a true heart, a, a, a what? With a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast <clears throat> the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? He's faithful that promised. And so we have here, he says, let us hold fast our profession of our faith, for he is faithful that promised. You could hold fast. I'm going to tell you a lot of times because people were so trained of instant results. Did you, if you look at the Bible, look at the healings in the Bible and that kind of thing, uh, there's a lot of them that did not take place instantly. The Bible said even in the New Testament, they were healed as they went, or they were healed in the same, same hour, and they began to amend from that very hour. Amen? Now, let's face it, some of you are going to leave here tonight. It might be, I might be one of them. And we might ride down the road and pull in through cook, Cookout or Bojangles or whatever. Why? Because I don't want to have to take the time to go home and cook. May not have the time to go home and cook. Go get me a double big cheeseburger, mayonnaise, ketchup, mustard, and chili, some French fries, and a, get me a, get, or either that or get me a foot long hot dog. Hallelujah. Get me some, get me a Coke on that, that, that wonderful ice they have. Are you here? 
Why? Because if we need to go home and take care of it, I got to go home and, you know, fire up the grill, pat out some burgers, cook them on the grill, make it all. We are trained in so many arenas of life for the fast and the easy. Amen. Now, look, I like homemade mashed I like to take mashed potatoes and I like to cook them and boil them and mash them up and put cream in them and all that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you what, it's kind of easy just to take out them, them powder things and throw them in there and throw some stuff in and go, whoop, 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 got mashed potatoes. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, I do dress mine up. I'll use heavy whipping cream and that kind of stuff in them to kind of give them more body, and we'll put, put truckloads of butter in them. And we'll work on them real hard to make them taste better than, you know, what they are. But society has trained us. You don't get up and cook breakfast anymore. Why? Bojangles got your biscuit waiting. And the one on High Point Road, when they got all their crew there, you'll, you'll pay at one window, and you'll be hanging it out the window at the next one. Don't even have to hardly stop. You know, go out and grab it on the way by. Hallelujah. How do I know? Because every Sunday I go by and get me and Nathan and a biscuit <laughs> and grab one for Janie and put it and keep it warm for her while we're doing stuff already at the church. Boy, it's easy. See, we're trained. We're trained for speed and ease. But there are some things in life, I don't care how much you like Speed and ease don't take place that way. Now, um, Nathan always tries to do at least, at least a small garden every year. Now, we've got, we like to grow our own collars because you can't get our kind of collars anywhere around here. We grow cabbage collars. They're an Eastern Carolina thing. Miss Geraldine likes it, so we gave her some seeds this year because she's going to grow her some next year because that's something you get down to Eastern Carolina. They somewhere in time, they crossed some cabbage and collards and got a sweeter collar. They're not as bitter as the regular as other collards. And boy, I'm going to tell you what, when the frost hits and they get really good, they turn yellow and they get, mmm. It's just this wonderful. But you know, the Bible has a principle about seed. Now, it uses corn in the, in the parable that Jesus tells. He said, for first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. That denotes a process that can't be circumvented. You can't, yeah, you can go get the can of corn at the grocery store, but even if you go get the can of corn at the grocery store, somebody put it in the ground and it was a blade, the ear, and the full corn in the ear. Now, because the Word of God won't work for you canned, are you here? It's got to be your own revelation. You've got to know it for yourself. It doesn't do you any good for Dr. Bill to have the blade, the ear, and the full corner in the ear and have it canned sitting on the shelf. It won't work for you. You're going to have to go through the process. No way around it. Now, I know everybody, you know, we want to come in and have, we, we, listen, people start preaching supernatural debt cancellation. Remember that? About, about eight years ago, I mean, everybody's preaching, you know, your debt's going to be wiped out. But the people who were getting the quote, unquote, supernatural debt cancellation had had things in practice for years. People coming in and hearing that message thought they were going to get it overnight. So they even did that to Dad Hagen. You know, if you'll go back and listen to his teachings, you know, and the Lord told us that you know, the problem is a lot of people are teaching where they are now instead of how they got there. So go back and teach the ABCs of faith. See, people don't, don't remember him, unless they go back and get some old tapes and stuff, they don't remember him teaching back in the 60s and stuff how that he was riding down the road with the full windows of the car down at night. He had to drive at night because the tires were so bald that if you rode them in the daytime, the heat would cause them to, to blow out. He had to drive in the middle of the night so the tires would stay cool enough they wouldn't blow out. And they were bald. And, you know, he, didn't need, he didn't need rain because them tires were slick. <laughs> now, it works fine on racetracks to have slick tires with no water. What's the first thing to do when it starts raining in, in an indie style race? Bring out the flag and slow them down. Why? Them tires ain't made for that. They're bald, they're slick as glass. That, that's because they really grip that rubber when it's dry, that pavement when it's dry, but they don't work real good in the rain. Amen? So, you know, don't remember him selling his car for junk. It was worth more as junk as it was for him to try to pay the payments on it. Wore out three pairs of shoes walking to preach. See, now we hop in there and we want, you know, uh, houses and lands and all this kind of stuff and don't want to pay the price of the blade, the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. 
Amen? Are you here? See, we, we've, got, we've got to get back to understanding that getting rid of doubt and unbelief, there is a process you're going to go through, and you can't circumvent it. People can't lay hands on you and cast doubt out of you. Doubt can't be cast out by someone else. Doubt is driven out by feeding on the Word of God. Y'all here, you're going home. <clears throat> See, can't we, we're having a special doubt casting out service. Don't go. Hello. People come up. You know, I remember one time I was preaching somewhere, and this man came up. We were having a prayer line, and he came up, and, you know, and, and, I, and I said, what can, what can we pray you about? He says, I want a double portion of the anointing. Great. I didn't pray for a double portion for his anointing. I couldn't. I had no basis of faith to do it with. I said, now, you know, I, I, saw, I talked to him for a second. I said, now, look, you know, the Bible says Jesus had the Spirit without measure and firm. We have, we, have a, we have it by a measure. I said the double portion of the anointing was the double portion of the anointing on Elijah. There's no biblical reference of anyone else having that. And in no biblical place, I can pray that. Now, I can pray that God will increase you in wisdom and learning and understanding, and you'll walk in the fullness of the anointing for your life, yada, yada, yada. And we went along that line, but I couldn't go the other way. I want a, I want a quick shortcut to getting some people. People pray for, want stuff sometimes you can't get. And you can't, listen, uh, can, let's like um, when I was at, um, at, at Rhema, my, the, when I was there in 81, you know, this 80, 81 school year, uh, I think the year before or two years before Fred Price had come and he has a book called Faith, Foolishness, and Presumption and that's where he that was taught at Raymond and that's where that book came out of that two weeks he did it for two weeks taught for two weeks at the school taught the kids the, the kids the, well back then the students is it faith is it foolishness or is it presumption well they recorded all that and so the next classes that came in they showed it to them because they needed to hear it he said he had people come into his office and saying, Pastor, we need to talk to you. He said, okay. And they come into his office and say, well, what's the problem? Well, I'm pregnant. Well, great. Praise the Lord. Now, no, you don't understand. We would believe in God. I wouldn't get pregnant. He said, were you doing the things you needed to do to get pregnant? Well, yeah. That's why we're using faith. I wouldn't get pregnant. Without any kind of protection. Yeah. They actually believe they could not, they could use their faith not now, how can you use your faith to not be fruitful and multiply when that was the command of God? <laughs> now, be honest with you. How can you use your faith anti-Word of God? Yeah, that was just foolishness. And, and then he went to somebody's house one time to eat, and, and, and they, were, they were nice. They, they, they had, had enjoyed their food over the years. And... Uh, <laughs> They said, they, they got ready to pray, and they went, Lord, I cast the calories out of this food in Jesus' name. Now, you can't eat like a glutton and expect not to gain weight. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, you know, the all-you-can-eat buffet is, is not what the Bible was talking about when Paul said, I buffet my body daily. He did not say, I buffet my body daily. I buffet my body daily. I keep it under. Now, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Now, we, we, we've gotten a, a, a somewhat of a, a, of a real liking to knee-high orange. Now, we go out to the cheer wine place and buy, buy a case of the glass bottle long necks with real sugar in them. Now, you think the ones in the can at the grocery store taste good? Forget them. You drink one of these, and you, that's it. Now, they sell knee-high grape, too. Mm-hmm. And RC Cola, and Cheerwine, and Sundrop, and A&W Root Beer, all in the glass bottle long necks with real sugar in them. And not, not high fructose corn syrup, real sugar. Well, anyway, <laughs> I tell you, it'll bless you. Amen. But you know what? I can't drink as many as I want. I'd like to have about six or seven a day. But there's about 180 calories in each one. You drink six of those, that's, that's a thousand calories of your daily intake in one, in one thing. Pleasure. 
You can't do that. You know? Well, I'm like, Lord, I cast the calories out of these knee-high orange. You get them things cold. Put them in a cooler. Put ice on it. Put rock salt. Drop the temperature. Get ice in them. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. But I'm a fool. If I can believe I can put six or seven down and cast the calories out and don't think they're going to affect my weight. <laughs> Hello? Now, Joe, you know, Joe, the guy that played saxophone, he was over for the, Super, for the Super Bowl night, and we had a cooler full of stuff. We had all the guys, you know, they had some of his friends over. <clears throat> we had all those different glass bottle drinks in there. He drank, I think, six orange drinks. <laughs> he loves them. I mean, he loves a better... It, it, uh, He'd have loved the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I told Nate, I said, when you go to school tomorrow, uh, check him out, see if he turned orange. <laughs> Look at his eyes, around his eyes, see if there's a little orange in there. Hallelujah. Now, see, it's foolish to believe you're going to get doubt cast out of you. That, that was all to bring you this point. Things we do sometimes in the king, kingdom of God, it's foolish. Yeah, but I've got faith, but where did faith come from? If it's not, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's not faith. You have no authority to exercise something in the realm that the Word of God doesn't promise you. And the Word of God doesn't promise you casting the calories out of the food. Nor does it promise you that somebody can lay hands on you and cast the calories out of you. That, oh boy, did I get that mixed up or what? Cast doubt out of you. Thank you. I was going to my next point in my head at the same time. Well, you wish you could cast them carriers out, don't you? Yes. yes, amen. I want the spirit of gluttony cast out of me. You can't do it, but you can put a knife to your throat like the Bible says. That's what it says. He who is a glutton, let him put a knife to his throat. What's that mean? It means you have to take, take the bull by the horns and stop eating so much. Yeah. And let me say something. I've seen some 130-pound gluttons. I've seen some people who eat me under the table. And they're a little bit, how can you eat? There ain't no way your body can hold it. And you're still a glutton. Now, that being said, <clears throat> you can't cast doubt out of you. Anybody comes along going to have a special line, they're going to cast everything out of everybody. Uh, no, uh, the Bible said cast out devils. It didn't say anything about casting out doubt. Well, doubt said, no, it's not a devil. Now, it may be influence of, from a devil to bring doubt to you, but doubt is not a devil. Doubt is the believer not fully trusting in God and His Word. Unbelief, the same thing, doubt and unbelief. Probably wouldn't, uh, couldn't flip a coin and tell the difference between the two. Doubt is, yeah, I believe it's true, but you're not fully persuaded. Unbelief is, I just don't believe it. But they get the same results. They short-circuit your faith. And I can't cast that out of you. <clears throat> no one can have a word from you and cast it out of you. Yeah, but I know so-and-so, they, 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 they did some things by faith. They're probably the, spirit of, uh, the, the, the manifestation of special faith. And when they got right back out of it, they were right back where they were. Just like Elijah was after he slew the prophets. He did that. Listen, it was, it was working of miracles for him to be able to, to, to kill 450 men by himself at one time. It's also special faith in operation. But we know he didn't, it wasn't his own faith because as soon as it was over and Jezebel said she's going to kill him, he started crying and whining. Amen. So you can get to it. And so <clears throat> you can get to a manifestation of, of, a, of a gift or a special faith, a gift of special faith, but that doesn't rid you of your doubts. So how are we going to get rid of our doubts? We're going to have to get fed, filled up with the Word of God. And notice it said there again. What did it say? Um, let me get back to where my notes are. There we go. No doubt. Okay. 
It says that whosoever shall say be thou removed and be thou cast into sin shall not doubt in his heart. That's, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back over here in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for. For is understood to be because. For because in this passage would be the same thing. Because there's a reason. Here, he's telling you there is a reason you can hold fast your profession of faith without wavering. He's faithful that promised. You're going to need to spend time feeding upon the Word of God and meditating and reading the stories of the faithfulness of God. How that God kept His Word to Israel even 400 years after captivity, His Word still came true. Why? God has the Old Testament there for a reason. There are stories in there that are true. No, well, not all, they're all true, but there, there's, there's things in there that we need to understand are teaching us a principle about the things of God. You know, we had 1,500 years of silence between the last of the prophets and the coming of Jesus, but His Word's still true. He did exactly what He said He was going to do. Jesus came from exactly where He said He was going to come from. The Bible says this, when the fullness of times will come. You've got to stay strong and understand that some of the things that you're believing God for have to come in the fullness of time and not become wearied. Let us not be weary. What does the Scripture say? Let us not therefore be weary in well-doing. Why? Same thing Hebrews 10, 23 tells us. For, uh, for he's faithful that promised. You can't become weary in well-doing. You've got to stay steadfast. You got to stay connected. You got to you got to fight unbelief. Because why? Because the Bible says you can say to the mountain, "Be removed, be cast into the sea." And if you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that the things you say, so there there is a not doubting, and there is a believing. And really, the only way to get rid of doubt is to get so much believing in. There's no room for the doubt. Hello, you got you got to drive it out with belief, with with faith. With the Word of God, you have to drive it out. Amen? Let us not be weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen? God is faithful that promised to us. God loves you. God's for you. He will keep His Word. Amen? He'll do exactly what He said He would do. Y'all do know that, don't you? Now, you say amen. You say, you check your head, yes. I got some grunts. The thing is, you've got to keep maintaining that all the time. And if not, when you need the things, you're going to have to go back and refresh on them. Yes. Now, I remember Dad Hagen talking about how that, you know, he would, he would get phone calls. And Sister Aretha called and said, well, you know, uh, Ken's dealing with this or, or Pat's dealing with this. And he, he would just take time at night when he was in bed, when he wasn't meditating on service, and begin to meditate on healing scriptures before he would even pray. Well, he's out there teaching faith twice a day. Yep, but this was personal. He needed it for himself. He would set aside extra time and, and go back and meditate on those same things over and over again. Why? Because the Scripture says if you believe in your heart, and he says, it here, it said this, it said, and you say those things and you don't doubt in your heart, but believe what you say shall come to pass. It'll, you'll have what you say. He had to go back and make sure there wasn't any doubt in there. Isn't that amazing? See, we miss that sometimes. Ah, he just spoke and it happened. Well, yeah, but he didn't speak until he was sure there was no doubt in there. He made sure there was no doubt in there, so then when he did speak, he wasn't just blowing hot air into the wind. We've got to learn to do the same thing. Jesus even withdrew himself and prayed all night. Amen. He spent three hours in prayer on the night before he went to the cross, just getting prepared. Amen. Who for the joy that set before him endured the shame of the cross. He had to get into faith that when he, when he died on that cross, he was coming up on the other side as King of kings and Lord of lords. The angels came and ministered to him. I mean, he had to, he had to get himself prepared for what he was about to face. And he couldn't do it with doubt. You can't do it with doubt either. So, you got to make sure there is no doubt or unbelief permitted in your life. If you recognize or see it, you have to attack it. Amen? We may attack it. If you saw a rat running through your house, I, well, I know some of, you, some of you would jump up on the couch and go, ha, ha, ha. 
But other than that crowd, <laughs> amen. And even if you did that, you'd call for your husband or your wife, depending on how it is in your house. <laughs> Hallelujah. And have him come kill that rascal. <laughs> amen. Are y'all here? Y'all gone home? I mean, I, I, I've never seen, back uh, a number of years ago, um, actually, it's, it's back, man, we first moved to Greensboro, first year we were here, first year or two, uh, we were having the news, those kind of he was just going out, he had, in the traveling ministry at that time, and John and Michelle came to our house, did they even have the babies yet? It was just, just them, yeah, yeah, and uh, he called, and we had we set up a meeting, they came, and uh, uh, we're sitting in the house that we were living, we're renting a house at that time, and uh, this, this spider goes, what? We had just moved into the new house on, over on Pinot, not Pinot, but uh, Ar Argyle over here. It had been open, yeah, because they had just opened, finished the house and we had just moved in. They came by. Oh, so their second trip, too, because it was one of the other trips, not the first one, because they came to the Pinot house, too. Okay. One of their trips before they had children. And uh, this huge spider comes walking across the carpet. And of course, you know, no, no, no females like that. And I don't remember, was it Janie or, or Janie grabbed the J.C. Penney catalog and body slammed it on the spider and it crawled out from underneath. <laughs> uh, Arnold Schwarzy spider. I mean, you know, I mean, that spider crawled out from, I mean, wham! I forgot who, who killed it. It was green, nasty mess. Hallelujah. So, now what happened? That spider was seen. The object of everybody around that spider was to take it out. Rambo style, J.C. Penney catalog style, crush it, whatever it was going to, it was going to die. You need to attack unbelief the same way. When you see unbelief crawling through your life, you need to jump on it with your great big old Bible. Get your, get, get your family Bible out. They're bigger. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got harder covers on them. How many know what family, how many, hopefully everybody knows what a family Bible is. That's the big ones you put on the table and put all the list of who was born where. Nobody does it anymore. But anyway, and slam that unbelief, and I'm talking figuratively now, by putting the Word of God in you and coming after it. You have got to attack unbelief like it is a, <clears throat> like you've got arachnophobia with a spider. Hello? Like you can't stand rats. I mean, how many of you the, and I, I, I personally don't like centipedes. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of weird looking. They kind of freak me out sometimes. And I really don't like slugs. Pour like pour salt on them. Anyway, it's, it's cool to watch them go. <laughs> I don't know if that's perverse or whatever, but I guess it's cool. Because they, they gross me out. That little slime they leave behind them and all that stuff, little trail, you know. Just pour salt on them and get rid of them. You have to address unbelief the same way you would address a spider or a rat or anything like that in your house. Amen. With the same tenacity and the same fervor. Hello? Without the squealing. But anyway... You've got to deal with it. You've got to get rid of it. You have to see it for what it is. It is a problem. Hello? And if you let that go here, that spider might find its way into your bed tonight. Amen? You know, somebody see a snake in the house that couldn't get it. Nobody sleeps. Because everybody's wondering where, they, where, where, where that Slytherin thing is. Hello? And, and, and of course, now, I, I, now you're talking about something I don't like is snakes. I am a kill first, ask questions later when it comes to snakes. I don't check out to see if he's a friend of Jack yeah. <laughs> or if he'll kill a fella. 
I am hacking and whacking and cutting. I mean, I'm doing whatever it takes until we, are, we had done away with them. We were building um, um, the house that my, my mother-in-law still lives in, but uh, her dad built a house out in the country about 15 miles out of Greenville out at Shomerdine, North Carolina, where the Shomerdine Pentecostal Holiness Church used to be, and you hadn't been to a meeting until you went to Shomerdine. Who in the world names a little crossroads Shelmer dying? They did. Anyway, and so he, we were, uh, I guess her little brothers were young. They were under 10 at the time. And uh, we're, we're, we're building the house. And I, we go out on Saturdays. And every Saturday we went out and worked on the house building it. And, um, and so they had the house. We were up on the, um, we had gotten the roof in, you know, and dried in and stuff and still doing stuff. And uh, I, I think I had come down off the roof and was out in the backyard doing something. And all of a sudden the little brother started hollering, Snake! I mean, both of them going at it. They're little guys. And I come and running with a shovel. And it didn't take long for me to put him out of his misery. I mean, I, I mean we, we, we had snakes when I got done. Yeah. I didn't know what kind it was. I didn't know anything about it. It slithered. Now, Mr. Glisson got home a couple hours later because he had gone to Greenwood to get some stuff, building supplies or whatever. And they, uh, Eddie killed the snake. He went and looked at it, and he was upset. Yeah, he, it was a king snake. And he was going to put it under the house to keep the rats out. That was his pet snake for keeping the rats out of the house. I'll, I'll, I'll pay an exterminator. <laughs> I don't want no snake running around in my house. But if I got to go into there, I got to check and see where he is. Well, they can't hurt you. They slither. I don't like snakes. I'm not into them. Nathan says, I want to have a snake in the house. Not in my house. They have an uncanny way of getting out of those cages. And I do not intend to wake up in bed with something sliding by my legs. <laughs> Hello. Just saying. You've got to be the same way with unbelief. No unbelief in my house. Unbelief, kill first, ask questions later. But how did it get in? What kind of unbelief? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe it out first. You've got to be that way with it. You've got to have that same kind of whatever towards unbelief. Why? So it won't interfere with your faith. Because, see, the equation is you can say to the mountain but, and, believe, and not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say comes to pass. You've got to have both sides working. You can be believing what you're saying, but have doubt working against it on the inside of you. Amen. Short-circuit it. Amen. Glory to God.